All right, all right. Welcome to the IBD Insider, patient updates from the 2022 Crohn's and Colitis Congress. My name is Jordan Wilson. Uh, I am an ulcerative colitis patient myself. I was diagnosed in 2010, and I've been living with a J pouch since 2013. I have been working, volunteering for the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation since 2016. My favorite events are the Spin 4 Crohn's and Colitis Cures event, as well as the Raise Your Spirit um, tasting event. And with that being said, I can't wait for the program that we're going to bring to you today. Now, last week, we hosted the annual Crohn's and Colitis Congress, the premier meeting for IBD. More than 1,000 IBD health professionals and researchers came together to discuss the latest research about Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Today, we're taking the information presented at Congress and we're bringing it to you during IBD Insider so that you can have the most up-to-date information of your disease. You'll hear from patients and clinicians on a variety of topics, including precision medicine and IBD care, diet and nutrition, and technology and IBD. The information shared, obviously, is meant to be for educational purposes only and should not replace any advice or guidance from your own healthcare profession. This program will be recorded and posted on the IBD Insider website within a few days. Now we want this to be as interactive and engaging as it can be for you. So those joining via Zoom, we encourage you to submit your questions through the Q&A box, which can be found at the lower part of your screen. On behalf of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and the American Gastroenterological Association, I would like to thank the Leona M. and Harry B. Helmsley Charitable Trust for their generous support of this program and additional support provided by Faring Pharmaceuticals Incorporated, Arena Pharmaceuticals. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Jose Torres, who will lead us through our first discussion on precision medicine. Jose, let's shoot it over to you. Thank you, Jordan, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Jose Torres. I'm an ulcerative colitis patient myself as well and was diagnosed about 13 years ago during my freshman semester in college. I now have a J pouch, which I've had for about 10 years. Uh, some of my hobbies are traveling, fitness, and reading. My involvement with the foundation actually started while I was in college volunteering and interning locally at the Greater New York chapter. I went on to get involved with Camp Oasis and I've been a camp counselor for 11 years now. And I continue to volunteer in various capacities when I can like today. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. So thank you all again for those in attendance for spending a portion of your Saturday with us. And thank you to our panelists for this first segment focusing on precision medicine. Joining me on this panel today are Dr. Eugene Yen, Clinical Director for the Center for Crohn's and Colitis at the North Shore University Health System in Evanston, Illinois. Dr. Yen is also the Chair of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation's Patient Education Committee. We are also happy to have with us Dr. Jennifer Dotson. She is the co-director for the Center for Pediatric and Adolescent Inflammatory Bowel Disease at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. She's also the co-chair for the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation's Pediatric Affairs Committee. We also have Donna White Barnes joining us for this portion as a mom of a child with inflammatory bowel disease. Their disclosures are noted on the slide. Panelists, welcome and thank you again for joining the program. As Jordan mentioned, we heard from several world-renowned speakers at the Crohn's and Colitis Congress about this topic, uh, as you see them on the slide shown. For me, precision medicine means finding the right treatment at the right time for the right patient. So when I was first diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, my initial treatment plan was not helping relieve my symptoms. In fact, they seem to have been getting worse. So I ultimately had to seek another GI healthcare team who did utilize a more tailored approach that led to remission. And later after a severe flare up with my GI and colorectal surgeon, we came to the decision that a J pouch was the best option for my long-term health. Since then, I've actually had little to no symptoms and that was about 10 years ago now. So Dr. Yen, I'll direct the first question to you. You heard how I define precision medicine from my perspective, but can you define further for the audience what we mean by precision medicine in IBD care and why it's important? Sure, hi Jose, thanks. And thanks for um, inviting me today. I, I think you hit on all the points really well. You know, I, I think when we talk about precision medicine, it's trying to tailor a particular treatment towards an individual's characteristics. And I think, you know, as a, as a, as a doctor, we, we, we try to do this on a clinical level. We try to recognize that IBD is diverse. It's not one size fit all. 
but I think even at this meeting and even at the, with the research that's been going on, um, you know, I, I, we're, we're learning more about this. I think it's, it, you, you know, obviously it's, it's conceptually very attractive. Like you want to be able to not treat everybody like a one size fit all. But I, 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 and I, and I also think, um, you know, I, I think there's a, a few things to add on to what you said. It, it's not just like, you know, what's the best treatment for you, but can we predict whether you're going to have more problems, more severe disease? Um, what if we had more information before we started your treatment? Wouldn't that be important to sort of tailor the right program and treatment for you. And I think, you know, I, I think our ability to predict aggressive disease behavior, high-risk disease, people who might need surgery one day, um, you know, I, I think that that's that that that's something I think we talked a lot about. And I think, and then the other thing that we talked a lot about at this meeting is how we monitor for those people mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and, and monitoring to see if we're on the right path. So not only trying to predict, you know, if you're going to have a severe, you know, disease behavior, but also like, how are we making sure that this is the right plan for you? Thank you so much, Dr. Yan. That was a lot of great additional information to add on. Um, Dr. Dotson, knowing that everyone's disease can present differently, how is it that we can all use the same types of medications to treat the variation in all of our diseases? And what are some of the factors that doctors need to consider when determining a personalized treatment plan? Excellent question, Jose, and, and uh, thanks so much for the, um, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation for inviting me to, to talk with you today and share some of this exciting uh, uh, new data and stuff that's coming out from Congress. Um, so what's interesting about uh, inflammatory bowel disease is, you know, we, we know that this is a problem with the dysregulation and issues with our immune system and uh, problems with our microbiome. And most of the medications that we have um, to treat IBD are, are targeting, you know, specifically that inflammation in different ways. Um, and so the, the different medications we use, um, there's a variety of different what, reasons why we choose um, the different medications. So um, one, you know, of course, is, you know, which medications that we have um, in our armamentarium to be able to use. So things that are, are, are approved or that are approved for certain conditions. So some medications are, are approved or potentially just work better in one disease type versus another as far as Crohn's versus ulcerative colitis. Um, and then we have some medications that are approved just for patients over the age of 18. So I practice in pediatrics. And so we tend to have fewer medications that are approved for that age group. So some are chosen um, just because of uh, insurance type issues as far as you know, which, which, which ones we're able to actually select. Um, the other things that go into um, account with that are also the, the types of, of medications that they are, how they're delivered. Um, so some medications are, are given uh, orally or by mouth um, through pills. Um, some are injections, either through um, like a needle and syringe or um, like kind of those auto injector pens. So that's another way. And then we have other medications that are also given uh, through an IV that you place in the vein, um, those infusion type medications. Um, so sometimes that goes into a big part of that decision-making process, and especially for my end on, on the pediatric side, uh, where we have some patients that are more, you know, afraid of needles and things like that. So sometimes that goes into um, the decision-making process with, with children um, and their parents as well. Um, and then also that, that also has an effect on, um, you know, convenience. Um, so, you know, so for, for patients that are doing the injectables, um, sometimes as far as the biologic medications, that might be easier to do like at home or away from college or, you know, traveling, that sort of thing. Um, and it makes it a little bit more challenging sometimes with infusions, um, even though infusions we can still make work, but sometimes that's a, that can be a hurdle, especially for, uh, like I said, my patient population with, with college and, and school extracurricular activities and things. Um, a lot of our, um, you know, older teens or, or younger adults tend to favor like injectables for that convenience, for example. Um, so there, so it's a very personalized kind of tailored approach as far as, as which, which types. And then the other part of that too is you know, the, the type, not just the, whether it's Crohn's or UC, but the, the severity of the disease or the extent of the disease. Um, and certainly, um, the, some of the medications, um, are, you know, work a little better for patients that, um, have uh, perianal disease, um, either, you know, abscesses or fistula around their bottom. Um, you know, so, so certainly there's disease related factors that go into that decision as well. But I think importantly, you know, discussing all the different medication options with patients and their families and, and making that decision together, discussing risks benefits. Thank you so much. Brief, brief follow-up. That was, that was a lot of information. Is there anything specifically regarding pediatric that would apply to pediatric and not the general patient population that you described, or is this kind of everything you went over um, pediatric as well? 
Uh, a lot of overlap, uh, you know, yeah, um, I, I think the the FDA approval is part of it. Um, and then, you know, the, the formulation, um, especially when we run into pills. Um, so sometimes our pediatric patients aren't able to swallow pills. Um, so sometimes we'll have them work with our psychologists or child life teams to work on pill swallowing skills. And, you know, we've had kids down to like age three or four that have been able to swallow pills. Uh, or we have to choose medications that are, are able to be crushed and mixed um, or like capsules that are able to be opened and, and mixed in applesauce or pudding or something like that. So those are some considerations. Um, and, and then the, the other aspect too, um, you know, that we consider with medications is, is sometimes um, your, your sex. So for, um, you know, for, you know, women of childbearing age medications, for example, like methotrexate um, can cause harm um, to the baby um, should you become pregnant, um, you know, so, so those are discussions that we need to have, particularly in that age group. Um, and, and then there's also um, with another other class of medications, um, the thiopurines, um, the, that um, a group of medications has been associated, particularly in younger males um, with certain types of cancers or higher risk of, of cancers, again, low, low risk, but we see it more than compared to females. So sometimes we'll also uh, have discussions around that. Um, and, and as far as weighing risks and benefits of the different therapies. Thank you so much for, for that information, Dr. Dotson. Um, Donna, we'd like to bring you into the conversation. Uh, can you share for us your experiences you've had with working with your healthcare team to determine a personalized approach for your son? And how did you work and communicate with your healthcare team to make this shared decision together? And what did you find most helpful? Okay, so basically just to everything Dr. Dotson said was 100% true. You know, my son was diagnosed at nine years old, so he didn't know how to swallow pills. So that was like our major, major battle, you know, because of course, it's a trial and error thing. So we have to start with the pills, you know, and, and he didn't know how to swallow pills. So we had to try to, you know, find the different ways to, you know, get this medicine in his system so that we can see if it'll work, you know? So it, it's, it was just a trial and error, you know, um, when we did find medications that potentially would work, you know, we would keep a journal to try to determine, okay, what are the side effects that I'm seeing for my son? You know, there's a few things that, you know, I had to pay attention to as a parent, you know, because, you know, this medicine that he tried once, it caused a, a reaction. So, um, you know, you have to pay attention to those things. And then um, the communication with our doctors were just amazing. You know, they were always available. And, you know, if I noticed something that I didn't quite understand, you know, I'm sending a message, I'm making a phone call. Hey, does, is this supposed to happen? Um, you know, why is this going on? You know, and, and we never you know, heard about IBD at all. So for this to go on, and I don't understand it. So we're researching it together. You know, we're trying to figure this out. So of course, our medical team was like, right there in every single question I had every concern, they were there to help me and we work together. And, you know, if there's a different medicine that, you know, they suggested, I'm asking questions, you know, hey, that you said this is supposed to do this, okay, but what's this going on? You know, what, you know, what's what's the next step? So they that you know, it's a it's a team effort, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's it really is. It's a team effort. And you know, the ultimate goal is to get your your child in remission, you know, and so thank God we're we're there now, but it took a lot of work and a lot of communicating with you know, the medical staff to get there. So it's just, it's, it's patience and, you know, and just a lot of open communication. Yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing and being candid with that, Donna. I could definitely relate also coming from, a, you know, a community where IBD is kind of unheard of, going through mm -hmm. that, doing your own research. I mean, like, what what is this? What are the options and, and mm -hmm. all that? So thank you so much for sharing. Um, Dr. Yen, back back to you. Other than checking for persistent symptoms, how do healthcare providers determine how well a treatment for IBD is working and how to reach that sweet spot for the patient? Yeah, you know, I, I, it's, it's, uh, it's funny, listen, it's, it's, it's so good listening to your stories because I think we, we you know, we, we often have, you know, 10 minutes in the office to talk to you and <laughs> not understanding like the hours and hours you pour over information to try to figure out like what's best for your kids and yourself and things like that. 
Um, you know, I will say that, um, you know, the Crohn's College Foundation is a wonderful source. I'm, 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 I, I do a lot of volunteering, all of us do, um, just to make sure that everyone has more information. You know, nowadays when I talk to patients and their families, um, and, and Dr. Dotson and I are not that different in terms of our patient population. I, I treat adults, but you know, the majority of our patients with IBD are younger. And so we, um, you know, I'm, we're constantly having discussions with patients, but their parents, their family, their families as well. And I, I think what what I what I what I try to emphasize nowadays is that I, I obviously want you to feel better, and I want your symptoms to be better. But as physicians, we we raise the bar a little bit, and that's a good thing. We we, we want we we not only want you to feel good, but we want you to look good on the inside as well. And so we. Um, you know, we, we monitor, we, so we, we do a lot of monitoring for things. And that was, that was actually talked a lot about at the meeting. It's like, if you want to go on this medication, if you want to try something alternative, if you want to try a diet, if you want to try anything, we're going to monitor you to see if it's working, you know, not just, do you feel okay? Cause I remember mm -hmm. being a younger medical student and, um, and, 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 and if we saw a patient, we said, how are you feeling? You okay? Like that was it. And if they said, okay, then we would sort of see you later. And that was it. And then, you know, unfortunately, some of these people went up in the hospital a week later and, and, and you'd say like, well, well, you just told me you felt OK, you know, and, and I think, you know, and I, I think, um, you know, nowadays we're doing a lot more monitoring and that's not necessarily just colonoscopies. I don't know people sort of obviously hesitate with the procedures and stuff, but um, it's stool studies, it's blood tests and things like that to make sure, you know, the medicine is is bringing down the inflammation, the level of the drugs are okay. And so we're doing a lot more monitoring on top of just the symptoms. And that's where we really get into what we would call more tight control. And there's, there's these concepts called treat to target. And I think mm -hmm. we have these, we have these goals that are sort of not really symptom based. Like we still care, we want you to feel good, but at the same time, like if you look good on the inside and inflammation's down, you're going to feel fine. And, and, and then long-term it's even better. And so I think from a doctor's standpoint, I think it's it's a it's a it's a balance between making sure you we're, we're still listening to you if you, you feel good, but at the same time that we've got these harder endpoints to say like okay, this person's actually really good, and we're we're happy about that. Great, thank you so much, Doctor Ann, for for sharing that. Um, and Doctor Dotson, to to wrap up this conversation, would you mind walking us through some of the key takeaways about our discussion on precision medicine? Absolutely. So, um, so I think it's important that, you know, it, that we discuss in, with, with precision medicine, that this is something that's really, you know, tailored to an individual um, person and, and their treatments, you know, based on a variety of different things that we talked about as far as like their type of disease and, and their severity. Um, and then also some of those individual characteristics. So sometimes we, we do check certain types of genetic testing um, and certain types of exposures um, and even your microbiome can play a role. And there's lots of exciting research that's going on in, in those areas, um, but they're not fully integrated yet into clinical practice as far as what, what they really mean and how we can really use them to, um, to, to tweak therapies and really tailor things. And so that's ultimately where the field is going though. Um, the disease monitoring uh, by your healthcare team, um, you know, is is really important. And like Dr. Yen mentioned, this isn't just um, asking about symptoms. And so symptoms and quality of life are incredibly important. So being able to go to school and work, um, et cetera, and participate in all those activities that you want to do, um, you know, but like you said, we kind of, you know, set that bar high if we want things to look good on the inside. So we want to make sure that, um, you know, that the tissue is healing on the inside, um, that those biopsies look good, those the repeat imaging studies look good, um, and that we're using those um, different types of stool tests and blood tests to monitor the inflammation as well. And, um, and like we mentioned that there's different types of um, blood tests um, as far as like in antibodies that we check in the blood and different types of genetic testings that are, that are being done. And this is a really exciting area of, of research in IBD right now. And then the blood tests that we use uh, are really helpful in determining, um, you know, dosing sometimes, um, you know, particularly with, you know, different kinds of medications that, you know, at this point we know a lot about. Um, and so these medications, we're able to do like a genetic test and then determine if we shouldn't use that medication at all, or if we should start off on a low dose or maybe a higher dose, depending on how your body is breaking down that drug. And then we also have um, some of those blood tests too, that are, are newer and starting to be integrated into clinical practice where we're able to see 
how likely you are to have um, a more like significant immune response or develop antibodies against certain kinds of biologics. And so that helps also kind of guide therapy and dosing and, and other medications that we use. And so, um, and as Dr. Yen was mentioning too, the, 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 other med the other types of labs that we use are um, checking those drug levels. Um, and that's part of that therapeutic drug monitoring to optimize the, the dose of the, the biologic that you're on um, to, to make sure that it's working as well as possible for you and also reducing the risk of developing those antibodies and, and losing response to those meds. So more to come with precision medicine for sure in the future. That's really exciting. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Dotson. Before we dive into the Q&A, couple of more questions um, for you, Dr. Dotson, specifically. Um, Dr. Yarur, and I hope I said that right, and Dr. McGovern's uh, presentation at Congress addressed the role of serology or blood tests, which you mm -hmm. just mentioned, in diagnosing and predicting the course of IBD. So taking into account blood tests that look at genetic markers, what role does race and ethnicity or ancestry have in your approach to care and treatment? Yeah, ex excellent question. Um, and so this is a, a, a newer, um, you know, field as well, or a new aspect of research. Um, so, so one of the, um, you know, newer aspects. So one, like I said, one of the medications that we were that I was mentioning was, uh, for example, thiopurines. And so there is a medication that we, or a gene test that we we, we check for um, called the TPMT, and that helps us decide as far as the the type of dose that we might want to start off on um, if we're going to be using that class of medications. And then there's a a newer gene test that came out, and so it's N. UDT15, um, and and this one has been shown that if it's and um, if you have this type of gene mutation, that increases the risk of of dropping those white blood cell counts, um, uh, and so it suppresses your bone marrow more significantly, which puts you at risk. Um, and we see that um, that gene mutation higher in, in patients that are Asian de descent um, or Hispanic ethnicity, um, and so that is a, another potential um, way to kind of tailor or kind of have personalized medicine from that standpoint. And then there's also um, you know, additional you know, genetic, um, genetic markers and, and things that are being studied on the, the research side, but not quite ready yet for prime time. Um, and you know, as far as um, you know, looking at uh, specifically for race or ethnicity, but looking at um, you know, markers of disease severity or things like that. But that's probably the, the, the most hot topic right now is, is around the thiopurines. Excellent. Thank you so, so much, um, Dr. Dotson, Dr. Yen, and Donna. Um, and now we'll, we'll take some questions from our audience. So if you do have a question for one of our panelists, please type it in the Q&A box, which can be found at the lower part of your screen. I already see some questions coming in. Um, so our first question for Dr. Yen, uh, what advances in treatments and monitoring do we expect to see in the future? Uh, you know, I, I think that a lot of our, our understanding of, um, of the, the drug levels that we're looking at is, is, is improving over time. And like we talked about the other monitoring uh, tools, um, there, are, there are now blood tests, you know, you, you may have heard of the C-reactive protein or the SED rate. These are sort of old inflammatory markers that we would use in the blood to see if, you know, you had inflammation or not, but it was pretty nonspecific. They were sort of invented for other reasons, right? And we took them in the IBD world to sort of see if a patient was doing better now. You know, and, and nowadays we have stool tests and you call the fecal calprotectin level, which is a much more accurate study to see how inflamed you are. We have other blood tests to look to see if, you know, your Crohn's disease is under better remission too. And so I, I think, um, I, I think the disease monitoring stuff that we, that, that's a really exciting area that we talked about a lot at these meetings in terms of just make sure you're monitoring people. We have, we have the technology to monitor people a little bit better now. Um, and so I, I think that that's, uh, that was something we certainly talked about a lot this meeting. Thank you, Dr. Yen. Um, our next question is for, for both doctors on the panel. So one of our participants commented, to me, personalized medicine means someone looks at my genome and my microbiome and decides what pathways are causing IBD and alters that. Is that possible and is anyone working on it? Yeah, so, so I, I would say at, at, at it's certainly possible, um, and it's more in the research realm at this point. So we're not quite sure, um, you know, how to incorporate, you know, a specific findings from microbiome into clinical practice, and, and how 
um, you know, how those um, shifts might change with different therapies and how we could really target the, the microbiome from the specific therapies and things like that that we have now. There are certain types of um, yeah, like, like antibodies or certain aspects of, of genes that you know, we, we can check, um, often aren't part of just routine practice. Usually they're more for, for research purposes, but there are some models that are, that are being built. Um, so Dr. Corey Siegel, for example, has um, a, more of a precision-based model um, where it incorporates some of these you know, gene testings to look at um, you know, prognostic factors. And so you can kind of put in these different types of um, lab tests um, and then look at your, your risk of developing you know, different types of complications um, just based on those numbers over time. So, uh, so again, you know, not, not perfect. Um, and it also depends on the therapies and the limitations that we currently have with, with the medications that we have now. Thank you, Dr. Dotson. Dr. Yen, anything to add to that? Okay, thank you. You covered it, Dr. Dotson. Thank you. <laughs> um, so the next question is, is also for, for you, Dr. Dotson. What is therapeutic drug monitoring and what medications are included in this monitoring? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so therapeutic drug monitoring is when we check the level of the drug and um, and for antibodies. Um, so the medications that have been around the longest are like infliximab and adalimumab, and so we know the most or have the most um, you know literature or research around those medications in particular and what those different levels mean um, and what are uh, good target doses um, you know for those. Um, and so what what when we talk about therapeutic drug monitoring, there's, there's two different aspects of that. You know, one is what we call proactive therapeutic drug monitoring, where essentially, even if you're feeling well, we'll check a level. Um, so in, in pediatrics, it's fairly common for us in, in, in the pediatric practice world, uh, where we check drug levels, um, you know, during um, that towards the end of that induction phase. So after patients have received several um, infusions, for example, of like infl um, of um, in infliximab. Um, and so that helps us decide what we need to do with that maintenance dosing moving forward. Um, so if the levels are really low, then we might do a higher dose or, or shrink that interval from like every eight, eight weeks to every six weeks or every four weeks. So we use it to really um, help kind of target the, the drug in a good range um, mm -hmm. and by adjusting that dose in that interval. And that's how we use that. And then we also can check um, antibodies with that as well. And so there's different types of, of tests that are done, um, you know, but, but we, we are able to, to look at the, um, the antibodies. And so that helps us um, decide if it's, you know, low levels, usually we don't have to make much of a change, um, you know, um, and then if there's, you know, higher levels, then sometimes we need to just change to a completely different medication um, because that increases your risk of having infusion related reactions um, with infliximab, for example. So that's like one example of how we use it. Now, some of the, the newer medications, um, like ustekinanab and uh, vetalizumab, you know, we have some information around those those drug levels um, that's you know being done and you know in research and, and and looking at how those drug levels correlate with um, symptoms improving or um, the your intestines healing um, on on scope, um, but you know it's not nearly to the um, you know level of evidence that we have for like infliximab and adalimumab. So some of it depends on the type of medication you're on, and then we also check those levels if if patients are having um, flare-up symptoms, um, you know, or any sorts of, you know, reactions where we think they might be having infusion reactions. We'll want to see if they have those, those antibodies, for example. So there's a couple different ways how we, how we use the, um, the drug levels and antibodies. Thank you so much, Dr. Dotson. Um, and if you can also, there's been several questions around fecal transplant. So with regards to that, is fecal transplant treatment showing promise in remission or even curing IBD? And is it okay to explore if already on biologics and in remission? Yeah. So, so, so at this point on the, uh, so I can let Dr. Yen chime in from the, from the adult side, but on the pediatric side, um, it's certainly not an, an, an approved, um, you know, therapy for our patients. We, there are um, some, some places that are doing uh, fecal transplants for IBD part of uh, clinical trials, but not something that we routinely offer as a, um, as a therapy um, where it is approved. And we do use it for therapy are our patients that have issues with uh, recurrent um, like C. difficile infections, for example, and it's been very effective for the treatment 
of that, um, but we just haven't seen those you know, same results. Um, so a lot of the studies with the fecal transplant are, uh, are smaller studies um, and kind of have some mixed results. Um, so it's tough to, tough to say where that's gonna go, but, um, you know, but I certainly think that there's you know, some promise there for, for, for certain patients. Um, but the, the issue, there's a lot of issues around that, you know, as far as, you know, where you get the samples, how often do you need to do the fecal transplant at what intervals, like, you know, so it, it doesn't seem like it's going to be a one and done, but you probably need to have at certain intervals, repeat fecal transplants. And, um, you know, so there's, uh, there's a lot to still be learned before that turns into a, a, a mainstay um, therapy. So I'll defer to Dr. Yancey if, if there's anything else more on the uh, adult side that that's newer coming down the pipeline with that, but. Uh, it seems Dr. Yan is having some technical oh, difficulties. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, no but, problem. But thank you. Uh, and the last question we have time for is for Donna. So uh, a question from the audience. My GI doctor is very busy and doesn't seem to have a lot of time to monitor me and address my concerns. How can I communicate with him to make sure my concerns are addressed and that my IBD is looked after? Uh, well, I mean... <laughs> We use my chart a lot, so I'm not sure, you know, if that's something that you have, and it's just um, where we send messages to the doctor, and, you know, of course, when they have time, they, you know, respond to the messages. Um, the nursing staff was really, really, you know, really helpful, you know, in the entire situation, so sometimes if the doctor can't respond to my question immediately, then the nurse will come in and say, hey, you know, we see your, your question. I'm going to get with the doctor and make sure, you know, he gets the answer, the, the answer to you. But it, I didn't really have that problem, you know, but during appointments, you know, make sure that you're, you know, vocal, write down all of your questions before you get to your appointment, you know, and then when you finally get there, go ahead and just let, just give them to them, you know, just let them have it, you know, but it, that's your time. I know, you know, it's only about 10 minutes per patient, but it's your doctor. You know, if you come in there with the list of questions, you're there, they, they're going to answer them, you know, so it's just write your questions down. You know, if you can't get a response immediately when you're in the, your appointment, ask your questions then, you know, and that's kind of what I did with my son, you know, he was nine, now he's a teenager. So mm -hmm. he's over the appointment, you know, <laughs> when we're going in there. So, you know, it's just write your questions down is the only thing that I can advise, you know. Uh, Jose, can I chime in too? Uh, so Sure. We have about a minute, then we have to transition. <laughs> Real quick. So, so, so I, yes, I, I agree with everything that Donna said, certainly, you know, you know, preparing ahead of time, making sure you have a list of, you know, questions and concerns that you have to make sure that those things are being met, you know, first in that appointment. Um, but, you know, and, and, you know, we, we take additional time when we need to, or sometimes make an, an extra appointment if we, you know, are running late behind other patients and we, we might, might need to set up another appointment to discuss additional issues if there's a lot. Um, but certainly, you know, calling the office, talking with the, you know, the IBD nurse in the office, um, using the patient portal is another way to, um, to reach your provider. But, you know, please make sure that you're saying like, I have questions or concerns that, that still need to be addressed and make sure they're being addressed. And if there, if it's a continual issue with your provider, then that's where honestly, I would say you probably need to look at another provider. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so, you know, either somebody in the practice or, um, or, or somebody else, you know, another IBD provider in their practice or at another group. Um, and, you know, and Crohn's and colitis can certainly be a resource to try to help find some folks. Um, you know, I certainly help patients find, you know, if they're looking for somebody in other areas in Ohio or other places in the country, and we can put you in contact with some people that are IBD specialists that, um, that we know personally or, or know of that would be good fits. Because sometimes not every doctor is a good fit for every patient and that's okay. You know, sometimes you just need a, a, you just jive better with somebody different. So if they're not meeting your needs and you've expressed those needs and it's an issue, I, I think the best case for you and your, your IBD to make sure everything is taken care of, is probably to switch to somebody that's a, um, a better fit for you. So, so don't be afraid to do that and advocate for yourself and, and get that second opinion and, and switch care if you need to. Excellent. Well, thank you all. And thank you for all the questions that came in from the audience. Um, again, huge thank you to our panelists uh, and against the audience as well. This was a great discussion and we learned some helpful tips and information about precision medicine. Um, so again, can't thank all participants enough. And now I'd like to turn the program over to Macy Stahl for a discussion on diet and nutrition in IBD. Hi there. Um, thank you so much, Jose, for that great introduction and panelists for such a wonderful session. Um, I learned so much. Uh, 
I'm super excited to introduce you to the diet and nutrition nutrition section. My name is Macy Stahl. Um, I'm a student at the University of Virginia, and I've had Crohn's disease for about 12 years now. Um, our panelists today are Brittany Roman Green. She's an IBD specialized virtual private care, registered dietitian and nutritionist, certified personal trainer and behavior specialist who was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis about 20 years ago. Brittany is also a member of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation's National Scientific Advisory Committee. And we also have Donna White Barnes staying on for this panel as well. Excited to hear her feedback again. Um, and she is a mom of a child with inflammatory bowel disease. Their disclosures are noted on the slide and panelists welcome and thank you so much for joining the program. Um, we heard from several renowned speakers at the Crohn's and Colitis Congress about this topic as you see them on the slide shown. And on a personal level, you know, I've experienced um, quite the impact with IBD and diet myself. I was diagnosed with Crohn's when I was eight years old and, you know, quickly my carefree childhood turned into a life of pain medication and side effects. And through the years I learned to manage my condition, but the diet aspect was always so difficult for me to figure out. Um, my mom and I have always looked at, you know, the intricacies of my Crohn's disease as kind of like a puzzle, but the diet piece was always one that I struggled to pinpoint and figure out. I, pace, I faced some severe flares that sent me into spirals of malnutrition, and it took months of nutritionists and primarily liquid feeding to get me to a stable place. But without proper nutrition, I wouldn't be able to, you know, be at college right now or do any of the things that I love to do. So um, it's inspired my life path, and I'm planning on going to a career in nutrition as well so I can help other IBD patients who might be struggling to find the same answers for their condition. So want to jump right into a discussion um, with our panelists and I'll direct my first question to Brittany. Um, Brittany, can you tell us a little bit about what role diet plays in Crohn's and ulcerative colitis? You know, if there's no known diet that we all should be on or there's no way to know if, you know, diet causes the condition, why is it such an important topic in IBD care? Yeah, great question, Macy, and thank you to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation for inviting me to speak today. So there are actually a lot of research studies on how diet is linked to IBD. So there's some research studies on, that suggest frequent intake of certain foods, such as processed foods, um, added sugars, salty foods, inadequate consumption of omega-3, um, high animal protein intake, as well as low fruit and vegetable intake, all may increase the risk of developing IBD. We also have some studies that look at different foods and the risk of for active disease. For instance, UC patients who consume red meat on a daily basis were five times more likely to flare than those who consumed it once a week or less. We also have some studies that look at how foods are associated with inflammatory markers. Um, during the conference, there, one of the presenters talked about a study that found leafy green um, vegetable intake to be associated with a fecal calprotectin less than 100 and a high intake of omega-3 fatty acid rich foods to be associated with a C-reactive protein less than five, which I thought was really interesting. Um, we also have some studies that look at diet for induction of remission of IBD. So exclusive enteral nutrition, which is where 100% of your calories come from from um, oral nutrition supplements is the first line treatment for inducing remission in Crohn's disease pediatric patients. We also have studies that look at diet for the maintenance of remission and diet and nutrients impact on disease course. So we know exclusive enteral nutrition has been used prior to surgery in Crohn's disease patients to improve post-op outcomes. It's also been used in Crohn's disease patients with perianal fistulas, we also know malnutrition, eating disorders, and potentially even nutrient deficiencies all negatively impact disease outcomes. Uh, we also know diet has been studied for uh, an adjunctive therapy for reducing symptoms and improving overall quality of life. So basically, diet does matter in IVD. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Brittany. Um, such wonderful information there. Uh, kind of a follow up. What about um, the microbiome? I know there's a lot of talk about microbiome and IBD care. Are there ways that patients can improve their microbiome or is that something that we should be looking for? Absolutely. So one of the presenters talked about how dietary fiber and certain antioxidants can positively impact the microbiome. And for that, really variety is key. So Plant-based foods can increase 
different types of beneficial gut bacteria. So we want to slowly increase the variety of these types of foods in our diet. Um, I've also find the variety over restriction approach to be helpful for reducing inflammatory foods in the diet in a more natural approach as well. So for instance, instead of focusing on restricting red meat intake, you can focus on adding in a greater variety of protein into your diet. And that way you're going to naturally decrease red meat because you're also going to be consuming chicken and turkey and salmon and, you know, tuna, tofu, nut seeds, and legumes all throughout the week. Um, I also think it's really important to focus on making small swaps in the diet instead of trying to make dramatic changes to your diet. Because sure, while following that restrictive diet, you may have some improvements in your microbiome, but oftentimes these diets are really tough to stick to for the long haul. So, and what we really care about are sustainable changes to the gut, because that's likely what's going to make the biggest difference on our health. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm like writing things, thinking of things, writing things down as I'm hearing you speak. Those are wonderful points. Um, next question again to you. You know, one of the biggest topics we heard at the Crohn's and Colitis Congress was how to manage malnutrition and disordered eating, obviously two really big points um, in IBD care. So what are some of the important things we should know about the discussion from malnutrition, specifically what types of screening tools or tests can patients be looking for, things like that? Yeah, so um, up to 85% of patients in the hospital with IBD may be malnourished. And we know that malnutrition negatively impacts disease outcomes. So really all patients should be screened for malnutrition. A validated yet really simple tool to use is the malnutrition universal screening tool. And for that, patients can actually ask themselves, have I lost weight recently without trying? And, you know, have I been eating poorly because of a decreased appetite? Really, if you answer yes to either of those questions, you would definitely get benefit. You would benefit from um, getting support from an IBD-focused registered dietitian. Awesome. And kind of a follow-up to that, um, we also learned from the con Congress that it's super important to acknowledge how mental health can be affected when managing diet and nutrition as an IBD patient. Um, can you talk briefly about you know impacts on mental health and how that can kind of affect the diet? Absolutely. Um, I was really glad that this was a discussion that was talked about during the conference because up to 24% of patients with IBD uh, you know, have eating disorders. And some studies suggest that up to 93% have disordered eating patterns. And Dr. Taft, um, a gut psychologist, talked about void avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, which is an eating disorder characterized by significant weight loss, significant nutritional nutri nutrient deficiencies, dependence on enteral nutrition, and marked interference with psychosocial function. And we know that eating disorders negatively impact disease outcomes. Um, so we should be screening for those regularly. Um, we also know how our cultural background impacts our decisions on medical treatments and also, um, you know, even potentially blaming oneself for, you know, um, ha quote unquote, causing our IBD from our diet, which is like a heavy weight to be bearing on your shoulders. And there's not enough research to, you know, we know there's many factors that go into the development of IBD, not just diet, um, but sometimes that's a weight that people bear. Um, and all of those things are really challenging to deal with. So I think it's important to work with a gut psychologist and a registered dietitian if you're struggling with certainly any sort of um, eating disorders or disordered eating patterns, and certainly a psychologist if you are struggling with um, blaming yourself for the disease and flares. Yeah. Thank you so much. Those are awesome points. Uh, super important. Donna, I want to bring you into the conversation here. Um, I remember for me, you know, how difficult it was as a teen just to learn and manage nutrition with IBD when all my other friends seemed to be healthy, happy, participating in sports, things like that. Um, Donna, as a parent with a child who has IBD, have you, how have you worked to help develop healthy eating habits with your child? Um, it was really difficult because like I said, Chad was nine when he was diagnosed. So a nine-year-old, they want to eat everything under the sun, everything crazy he wanted to eat. But 
you know, when he was diagnosed, we had to take a step back from certain things, you know, you know, we, we kept a food journal. That was our main thing, the food journal. So, you know, he would eat certain things and, you know, I made him write down, how did this make you feel after you ate it? You know, because you really don't know what effect, you know, certain foods will have until you actually eat them, you know? So we did the food journal and that was really helpful. So now we're in the state to where we know what he can eat and what he just cannot eat, you know, under no circumstances. So, um, and I think our biggest struggle was, again, he's nine, you know, he wanted to eat the flaming hot chips and, you know, and stuff like that. Well, hey, <laughs> you know, we can't do that. So, you know, we had to kind of cut back on a lot of stuff. And of course, he's nine. So he's, he's upset. Mom, my friend's eating, you know, they can eat these. Why can't I? You know, so we had to have those conversations with the doctor and, you know, and, and get to a place to where now he knows I can't eat that. You know, I see my friend, they can eat them, but I can't eat them, you know. So it, it, it's a process, but we're in a good place. So <laughs> thank you, Donna. Yeah, I resonate quite a bit with what you said <laughs> there. Um, I was pretty young when I was diagnosed, too. So that food journal was you know, I was writing things in it every single day. I, it took mm -hmm. weeks and months to kind of figure out what worked for me, but that's such a pivotal step, you know, um, kind of a follow up to that. What what resources have you found or where have you looked for resources um, to help curate a diet that works for your child? Um, the food journal is very instrumental, you know, and we also use the, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation website, you know, we kind of look on there and we, you know, we check the different sites to find recipes that, you know, kind of help because of course, it's kind of difficult, you know, trying to find something to keep a nine year old interested in eating, you know, their dinner. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, you know, found recipes, you know, we looked at different articles to see what's going to be something that we can eat that's somewhat normal but safe <laughs> so that's that's what we use <laughs> awesome thank you so much if you mm -hmm. if you have any recipes send them my way too I'm always I'm always <laughs> looking for something new uh, well thank you guys so much for that discussion um, I kind of want to move into some key takeaways here I know Brittany to wrap up this discussion um, I think you were going to walk us through some key takeaways about uh, what we kind of touched on so that would be wonderful Absolutely. So malnutrition is common in people with IBD and can negatively impact disease outcomes. So work with an IBD focused registered dietitian if you've recently lost weight without trying and or have been eating poorly due to decreased appetite. Um, one of the things that I wasn't able to talk about today, but I thought was really cool, so I want to add in here, was they created a um, food IBD food guide pyramid, which recommended two to four servings of fruits a day, three to four servings of vegetables, including leafy greens, purple, and orange vegetables, one to two servings of cooked and cooled starches every day. For protein, try to choose a variety of options throughout the week. Um, the DINE CD study showed us that there were no significant differences between the Mediterranean diet and the specific carbohydrate diet in reducing symptoms. And so for that, you know, let's go with the less restrictive approach. Um, the Crohn's disease exclusion diet with partial enteral nutrition um, may be an option for sustaining remission in, in children with mild to moderate Crohn's disease, but always work with your IBD team before deciding to implement any type of therapeutic diet. Um, if you've lost weight recently, have nutrient deficiencies, depend on oral nutrition supplements, and feel diet restrictions interfere with your social life, or you just know your relationship with food isn't really where you want it to be, Consider working with an IBD-focused registered dietitian and ideally a gut psychologist as well to improve your relationship with food and your nutrition status. And lastly, diet does matter for IBD. Diet appears to influence the prevention of IBD. Once diagnosed, it plays a role in disease activity, surgical outcomes, managing symptoms, and improving overall quality of life.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Brittany. Uh, those were absolutely wonderful. And now I'm super excited to move into a Q&A session with um, our live audience. So audience, if you want to um, direct some questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A box, which can be found at the lower part of your screen. Um, the first question that I'm seeing here and we're going to touch on is, you know, we know the world around us affects the foods we eat and influences our diet. So this is directed toward you, Brittany. Um, what are some considerations that IBD patients should keep in mind when navigating diet? Yeah, I think I would advise against searching the internet uh, for advice for IBD. There's a lot of Mis nutrition misinformation out there, and that often leads to overwhelm, confusion, and potentially overly restrictive diets. Because you know, oftentimes everyone says something different about how what to recommend for their diet. So instead, I'd recommend going to finding a trusted source like the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation website and or an IBD focused registered dietitian to really get individual support for that. Yeah, awesome. Um, Donna, if if you can discuss, maybe put some input in there on some experiences that you've had with this kind of thing. Well, I do, we do use the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation website to, you know, go back and look at, <clears throat> excuse me, things that, you know, we can kind of hold on to because there is a lot of misinformation that's out there, like seriously, you know, and then if we have questions like in-depth questions, we go to his doctor, you know, and his doctor was really, really, you know, he's really good with saying, hey, this is something that, you know, you need to try, try to eat more of this, more of this, you know, so we, you know, we held on to those things, and that's kind of how we plan our dinner, and, you know, <laughs> so it's just, it's a, you have to find those things and stick with them, and if they work, just, just hold on to them, that's all I can suggest. <laughs> yeah, and, and I know that's, that's been tough for me, too, I've, you know, it's it's hard, like you said, Brittany, looking online is not necessarily um, the trusted place. So, you know, resources like the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation website, um, also the American Gastroenterological um, Association website are great places to look and to start when you're coming up with, you know, recipes, diets, things like that. And as a college student, navigating college um, with IBD was really stressful in terms of diet as well. So looking towards resources like your student disabilities access centers, if you're a college student, um, they help me get connected with a dietitian on campus. So those resources are available for you. Um, you just have to look for them. All right, excited to move into um, the next question from our audience. So for Brittany, um, when working with a new dietitian, what should you look for slash how do you know if it's the right fit? I think definitely making sure that they have um, a lot of experience helping people with IBD. And I, the way that I, the reason why they, I say that is because IBD, there's a lot of intricacies with IBD. And so it can, unless you're focusing on it, there's a lot that you could miss. And so, you know, making sure that a dietitian has that experience is really important. Mm -hmm. um, also make sure that, you know, I think it's helpful if they're mem professional members of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, because then maybe they're, you know, evolved a little bit more and staying up to date in the latest research. And also, um, you know, seeing, gauging their experience in disordered eating and eating disorders, because uh, people with IBD, so many of us have um, issues with those. So I think it's also important that they have experience in that as well. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, kind of continuing with that with uh, another question from our audience, a great question. Um, there's a lot of, you know, discussion about anti-inflammatory diets and vegan and vegetarian diets. Um, is there anything specific that patients should know or should think about when maybe adopting one of these diets? I think, I mean, I always recommend trying to make slow changes to the diet rather than drastic changes. I know like sometimes people can get excited and they want to make changes and they also want to have symptom reduce, you know, reduce your symptoms as soon as possible. But, you know, in order to really keep make those changes sustainable, 
we have to make those changes small and just make swaps in the diet rather than, you know, next week increasing your diet and completely changing it because that's really stressful. So I would say that is a, one of the biggest things, recommendations I would have. Um, and yeah, I think like there are certain times where I probably would hold off from making drastic changes in the diet, such as, you know, when you're in a really bad flare or, you know, have really bad active disease, it may not be, or like, let's say if you have C. diff or some sort of fecal infection, probably then is, is not the right time to start drastically changing your diet and including a lot more fiber. But um, if you want to implement one of those diets, then I would recommend working with a dietitian to help you slowly make that transition. Because sometimes it's also hard to just stay committed to making small changes over time. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, next question, Donna, I'm going to, I'm going to direct this one to you. Uh, what are some ways to make appropriate food selections while traveling? Uh, sometimes it's hard to make great choices while traveling due to limits. What are some ways that this can be simplified? Um, well, that's pretty interesting because we did travel, you know, recently and I had to pack snacks that I know Chad can eat, you know, so I, I couldn't depend on going to the airport and, you know, making sure that they have the things that he can eat and, you know, that he can actually get. So I had to make sure that I packed accordingly. So I know it's, it, it is extremely difficult to, you know, plan ahead, but you got to plan ahead. I mean, you know, it, it is just a part of having this disease. You have to plan ahead, unfortunately, you know, and so me planning ahead is teaching him how to, you know, start planning so that when he does go off to college, he knows exactly, you know, those things that he needs to do, you know, to get prepared if he needs to have a snack or something, or this is what his options are. So because it, it they are limited, you know, to what the things that they can eat when, when you're out and about. So you have to kind of plan accordingly, unfortunately. Yeah. Thank you so much, Donna. I know I can relate to that too. Um, every vacation I've ever been on, I've had a full suitcase of, you know, <laughs> liquid nutrition in there or snacks, things like that. Um, but it, it's what you have to do sometimes. And, and it does make it less stressful and less anxiety provoking, I would say. Um, Brittany, do you want to add any, any thoughts to that? Yeah, I would definitely echo what Donna was saying. Um, and then I would say, also, if you're traveling by car, um, one of the things that I like to do is instead of stopping at fast food places where there's really limited options that are going to work well um, for a lot of us, I actually like stopping at grocery stores, which you kind of have to get off, you know, go into a town a little bit. Um, so I understand that's not the case for, you know, everywhere you go, but um yeah, usually they have better options there. And, and so that's usually what I do. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much for all of your input. I know I learned lots of stuff in this discussion and, and I'm sure our audience did, did as well. Um, and now it's, it's my pleasure to turn this program over to Jordan for a discussion on technology and IBD. All right, thank you, Macy, and thank you everybody for joining this program. This segment um, of our talk is gonna focus on technology and IBD care. So joining me on this panel today are Dr. Sandra Quesada, Associate Professor of Medicine for the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. We also have Jose Torres, an IBD patient, joining us for this session. Their disclosures are noted on this slide. Panelists, welcome and thank you for joining the program. Now, we heard from several world-renowned speakers at the Crohn's and Colitis Congress about this topic, as you can see them on the slide that's being shown. And now I'm supposed to share uh, why I think technology is important in IBD care. And I can honestly tell you, I would not be sitting here today if it wasn't for technological advances in IBD care. Um, I was rushed to the hospital during a very severe flare with very intense um, ulcerative colitis symptoms. After speaking with my doctor and having a consultation, I was immediately 
admitted to uh, surgery where I had my J pouch constructed. And during my recovery, while I was in the recovery room, the surgeon told my parents if I had waited a little longer to come in or if I was a little bit older, I would not be alive. So I am a patient who has benefited tremendously from the technological advances in IBD care. Um, so let's start this discussion now. And my first question will be for uh, Dr. Quezada. Now, excuse me, we all use technology in our lives to connect with each other, whether it's on our phones, our home devices, et cetera. But can you tell us how technology is changing IBD care? And are there some examples that you could share with us? Sure. Um, thanks so much, Jordan. And um, you know, thank you to the AGA and, and CCF for putting together this very cool program. I feel fortunate I get to talk about technology and IBD care. I, I have to say that the, the sessions at the Crohn's and Colitis Congress on this topic were super interesting, and it was really exciting to hear about some of the cool things coming down the pike and on the horizon for IBD care. And some things are, are already happening, right? So just to your point that there are some technological advances that are already changing IBD care. And so just for some examples, um, certainly I think we all can relate to telehealth and telemedicine and how much that really sort of exploded out of necessity during the pandemic. Um, um, personally, I can say, even though one of my colleagues, uh, Ray Cross, had implemented some telemedicine uh, into his practice, more for clinical research purposes, but also into practice probably for about 15 years now, most of us weren't really using telemedicine um, at all. And so I think that that was uh, a big change for all of us to realize that this is actually something that's functional. It might even increase access and, and serve the needs of, of our patients in, in in a timely way. Uh, but also, I think, you know, it's important to recognize that there are some mobile apps, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, from, you know, from our previous panelists and, and our awesome patient and family members who shared sort of that onus that 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 uh, comes along with having to kind of monitor and keep track of what's happening. Um, keeping track of questions you might want to ask, a dietary journal and, and all of these things, there's technology to kind of assist with that now. But, you know, we should really be taking advantage of some of these technological tools to facilitate that kind of information tracking and sharing um, to make even those short appointment times maybe more efficient. Um, and then certainly artificial intelligence was a very cool topic that was discussed during the conference in um, just how different, uh, what they're calling deep neural networks and using basically artificial intelligence to assist endoscopists and being able to interpret the images that we see during endoscopy, maybe even predict what biopsy results might show. So some very interesting um, things that are uh, evolving in IBD care. That's really nice. And, and you actually kind of went into my next question for you was, and I was able to tune into this talk as well. We did hear from speakers at the Crohn's and Colitis Congress that technology is advancing in imaging, endoscopies, um, using artificial intelligence. Are you able to dive a little bit deeper and explain some more of that research to us? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think probably the, one of the ones that stood out to me the most was an investigation, for, in part because it was so big in terms of the, the data that they were able to evaluate and put together. So they were looking at literally like 40,000 endoscopic images and over 6,000 biopsy results from over 2,000 patients. So thousands and thousands of data points. And the point of the study was to see if these artificial intelligence programs could look basically at an endoscopic image as we would as endoscopists and be able to kind of rate and evaluate how much inflammation or inflammatory activity is present uh, and then compare that to what an, uh, in, an IBD expert or the endoscopist assessment would be. And they even were using that program to look again at those images, but to even be able to predict what kind of histologic or, or basically what uh, disease activity and inflammation would be present on biopsy results. And they uh, compared, you know, basically teaching this program to evaluate this and they compared it with the endoscopist's 
um, assessment of those images and also with the actual biopsy results. And it was really impressive to see that this, what they were calling a deep neural network, which, which you know, is assessing and, and processing all of this data, all of these images, was actually basically correlated um, or was compatible at 90% of the time with what the experts were seeing um, visibly in terms of inflammation and how they would rate that. Um, and then it actually was even a little bit better. It was 93% compatibility between what this artificial intelligence program was predicting would be seen on biopsy results, the degree of inflammation, and what actually was there on the biopsies. And the reason why this is really interesting and important is because um, there can be some inconsistency. You know, there can be some variability between endoscopists um, and sometimes even uh, the same endoscopist maybe one day thinks this looks a little bit redder than, than you know, and another day that, well, actually this doesn't look so bad. Um, now, I don't want to imply that there's like this huge variability, but there definitely, um, it's, it's not a perfect system. You know, we use, for example, an ulcerative colitis in the study I just mentioned was all ulcerative colitis patients. Um, in, in UC, we use uh, a scoring system, the Mayo score, to, to try to provide some consistency so that when we're communicating with each other about how much inflammation is a lot or how much is a little, that there's some kind of structure and understanding of what we're talking about, but there's still some wiggle room in there. And so what we're hoping then is that maybe something like this could really enhance the ability to have even more consistency and maybe even some more efficiency during the procedure. Um, another, another cool example using artificial intelligence that was presented was with respect to um, colorectal cancer screening, particularly, and this is relevant in the IBD patient population because um, it's not infrequent that, you know, polyps don't look sort of the classic way that they, you know, we expect to see sort of in a regular colon. Um, sometimes we, we have we find what are non-polypoid lesions, so they can be flat. Um, also, there's a background of inflammation sometimes that can make things a little bit harder to, to discern what a clear border is. Um, so they're developing, again, these uh, artificial intelligence, intelligence devices to maybe recognize and highlight like, hey, there's something here, you know, just kind of highlight an area, a potential lesion that could signal to the endoscopist, like, wait a minute, let me let me take a closer look here. Let me back up and look at this um, a little bit more in depth. Um, certainly not uh, that what, at least what my understanding is they were not trying to teach the program to diagnose and say, there's a polyp or here's a you know, here's a cancer or here's this and that. It really is more just like, hey, look over here again. So, so again, really an assistive tool or device to the endoscopist um, who in theory without that could potentially miss a, a lesion that clearly is difficult to identify without that. So, um, so really exciting um, AI assistance coming down the pike, we hope for, for our patients. Yeah, it does sound like there's some really interesting stuff coming. Um, you know, it's good to have like backup, you know, on your side to help out with these things. Um, let me follow up and let me ask Jose, what are your experiences um, with endoscopies? Um, are there common struggles that you faced? Uh, and do these technological advances resonate to you as being helpful for patients? Yeah, thank you, Jordan. I'll, I'll actually start with the last portion of that, just to follow up on what Dr. Gonzalo was just kind of describing. The, those advances really do resonate, particularly around the efficiency and kind of more standardization on communicating inflammation levels, because that's one of the key things our, our GIs provide to us is a gauge as to what our symptoms and kind of where we're at and a key thing to guide our, our therapies. Um, so all of that, I think, definitely speaks volumes to the patient community and is is of value. Um, as far as my experiences with uh, endoscopies, as most patients, we kind of ran the gamut of every type of endoscopy possible during the diagnosis phase, right? While they're trying to figure out exactly what it is. Is it IBD? Is it Crohn's? Is it colitis? Um, so yeah, I mean, frequent early on in the diagnosis phase. After that, I think every patient kind of gets into a cadence of having their you know, annual or biannual, however frequent their, their GI recommends having um, the scopes done. Um, but I think some of the, the common struggles faced by myself and many others I know that, that struggle with IBD 
is is the prep <laughs> is definitely one thing um, that that's definitely the least fun part of that uh, and also scheduling um, a bit and then timing on on results it, it can be difficult to schedule the endoscopy oftentimes within the ideal time frame that our GIs recommend it right um, so that's kind of just my overall um, experience and, and thoughts on that very nice thanks for sharing and yeah it's not you know I, I feel you, man. It's not breaking news that nobody likes to do the prep for those procedures. For those procedures. Um, doctor, let me ask you, are there any other technological breakthroughs that we can expect to see soon? And also selfishly, I'm curious, are there any advancements in surgical treatments that are on the horizon? Sure. Uh, well, well, some other interesting technological breakthroughs, uh, that one that I heard about at the, at the Congress was um, there's a, a tool being studied called the smart toilet, which I thought was really interesting. Um, it, it basically is, again, do, doing uh, all of us a good service and that it's giving us more information about um, what the experience is that we're asking patients to tell us about. And that could be hard to remember maybe how many times in a day you went over the last, um, you know, 14 days or, or longer. And also, you know, we asked so much about, can you describe the consistency and all of these things? And so again, sort of like what I was describing before that, that maybe this could be something that would give some, a little bit more consistency, kind of help give you uh, an additional tool that kind of backs up what, what you pretty, you, you're pretty sure you know that this is what was going on, um, but maybe you also have a reference point with that. So I think that that's going to be an interesting um, device that, that may come down the pike. And with respect to surgery, I mean, I think um, probably the most exciting advancement in, in surgical treatments for IBD has been the use of robotic assisted surgery. Um, you know, we've long since known that laparoscopic surgery is better than, say, open procedures. Um, but even with laparoscopic, um, there can be some limitations, and sometimes you have to convert to open because of you know, different scenarios that a surgeon may encounter. Um, the, what has been found with some of these robotic assisted procedures is that there is actually a really uh, increased dexterity, um, as you can imagine, uh, they're sort of extending their arms using this robotic device and can do some very, very fine tuned detail movement and work and even implement some of that artificial intelligence uh, imaging and, and interpretation interpretation of what's being seen um, in the gut in real time. So um, yeah, already there are, there are studies demonstrating that robotic surgery is associated with a decreased need to convert to open procedures compared to regular laparoscopic surgery, um, and then potentially also then um, decrease complications post-operatively. So um, at this point, I think that that's used still very much just at certain centers. Um, I'm hoping that you know with with more um, evidence to show that this is. Um, preferred and, and really improves patient outcomes, that this is something that will become more accessible uh, for more patients. You know what, you, you were talking about the robotics and, and that's how my surgery was performed with the use of the robotics. And I, I Googled this, the, what it looked like and then I watched this YouTube video and it can peel the skin off of a grape and then sew the skin back on a grape. It's like, crazy. The stuff that it can do is crazy, it's wild. <laughs> it's amazing, it, it's yeah. just, it's fantastic. Jose, let me ask you a question. We'll kind of shift gears here. Now we were talking about um, telehealth. Have you had to use telehealth and what was your experience like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, particularly during the height of uh, the pandemic, you know, I'm, I'm based in New York. So the only way to kind of get in touch with, with my GI at that point was telehealth. Um, and it was overall a, a good experience. Um, I think the, the key benefit of telehealth is really the, the accessibility. Uh, just to be able to see your doctor if you're not physically able to get to the office, whether it's health related or outside of, of that, um, and to be able to get that direct communication. And I think it also makes, again, scheduling a little bit easier. I'm sure we've all had the struggle as patients of trying to get CRGI if we're feeling something urgent, need to speak. Um, so for me, it, it's just great to be able to have that uh, and the extension of telehealth being these patient portals and the increased activity there to be able to message my GI or the, or the, the PA when I need something. Um, 
so yeah, just the accessibility has been a huge, huge benefit. Oh yeah, for sure. I just used a telehealth appointment the other day. <laughs> um, doctor, <laughs> since telehealth is becoming more and more useful as a tool that as we've seen during this pandemic, are there any lessons that we can apply to IBD care using telehealth? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think that, like I said before, I think, first of all, we, we all learned so much about how it seems to really be much more convenient um, for many of our patients. I think particularly for some of our patients who might be in more remote areas. Um, and, you know, I have had patients who, you know, they're doing two hour drives or three hour drives even um, to come to, to the visit. And then if you're doing a telehealth, not only is it um, you know, I could understand that the idea of doing the drive and, you know, A, that, that might be a half day or a full day out of work. Um, it also could be that you're flaring and the whole idea of being in the car and driving down there for so many hours is not sounding so good. Um, and so I think that there's also just a, depending on the setting uh, and purpose of the visit that, you know, telehealth could be a really great option that I hope we're able to continue moving forward beyond this sort of pandemic, which I, I know we're still in, and but I have hope that we're going to be out of there, out of the pandemic at some point. And, you know, I think for, in a lot of different ways, we talk about how um, what we don't want to do, I think, post pandemic is sort of go back to whatever we were doing before or quote unquote back to normal, but that we really hopefully have learned some important lessons um, and are really thinking about a new normal and, and how can we um, learn something from this and then make our options even better in the future. Uh, another important point that was talked about at the Congress, which I fully agree with, is, um, you know, our, our um, interactions during a visit, whether that's in person or over telemedicine, are sort of intermittent touch points, right, throughout a person's life and, and throughout their disease process. And obviously the disease doesn't go on hold in between. Lots of things are going on in between. And again, we've talked about how like maybe mobile apps uh, might be a, a really useful tool and are useful tools. It's actually a growing area where patients can um, have some better uh, assistance in keeping track with information, but also maybe communicating um, back uh, in between visits to um, providers to kind of give that feedback, give updates, um, maybe also get some information and educational material. So I think ultimately what hopefully that all translates to is that we're moving towards something that is a more patient-centered approach with IBD care rather than a system-centered approach um, and really empowering our patients to, to have the knowledge have the um, tools needed to be able to be very active partners in their care. Thank you for that. Um, I was gonna ask if for both of you, if you saw telehealth slowly replacing the in-office visit or if there will still need to be that face-to-face -face appointment, but doctor, it sounds like, um, you know, the dream scenario would be like a hybrid uh, of, of both of those. So um, thank you for answering that question that I had for you. Um, <laughs> Now that I have you still, would you uh, mind walking us through some of the key takeaways about our discussion on technology and IBD care for our patient audience? Oh, sure. Uh, I'd be happy to. So um, first, I just I, I think it's important to emphasize that this is just an exciting time to, to be in this field. And um, there is just so it's so much evolving and dynamic research that's going on from artificial intelligence to uh, implementing, um, oh, I, I didn't even mention that, you know, there, there are people researching maybe home fecal calprotectin um, tests, like how neat would that be, right? So you have some of those answers that we otherwise, you know, send, send, have to send you to a lab for to, to find out, well, is this, is this IBD or is it overlapping IBS or whatever? Like we wanna know like how much inflammation is there. Um, so, so just a really exciting time that uh, people are, are really uh, advancing and using technology to see how we can implement that into IBD care. Um, I, I've already kind of talked about some of the different mobile apps that we have available to track symptoms. And, um, and I, again, recognizing there've been a couple points earlier in the discussion today talking about how sometimes our appointment time is short and limited. It's not the ideal scenario either party really wants. And so maybe some of that can really make it a very efficient, at least exchange of information. So both patients are, are prepared and, and 
providers as well maybe have received some information in between. Um, we didn't talk as much yet about the social media platforms. That was a conversation during the Congress as well. Uh, just kind of recognizing, obviously, if we're talking about technology, we have to mention social media because it impacts everything. And um, certainly, I think, especially for our patients, it really is a space to create community uh, for people to, you know, find uh, others with, with this shared lived experience of IBD, maybe to um, you know, vent, um, discuss challenges, or maybe to share good news, right, and, and success stories. Uh, so information sharing, experience sharing, I think, again, just the importance of belonging and building community for patients and, and potentially also for providers, um, you know, we should think be thoughtful about how we could potentially use this as a platform to share information. Um, we talked already, I think, answering the last question, um, you know, I think uh, uh, as you, just as you said, uh, the ideal moving forward is we'll have some kind of a hybrid approach. Right? We don't have to be one or the other, either or. Hopefully we can really kind of have options and, and do what is right and, and what fits best um, for the context at that time. We actually, you know, the part of the reason why we've been able to do it now during the pandemic is because, um, you know, Congress mandated insurance companies have to reimburse for that. That's all under sort of an emergency state. So many Many of us with um, AGA, I'm sure CCF as well, have been advocating in Capitol Hill so that even beyond the pandemic, hopefully we'll be able to continue doing that. So hopefully that, that will be a tool we'll continue to be able to use. And then finally, you know, this last point says artificial intelligence, but I think it could even be broader, just generally speaking, technology and IBD clearly has the potential to reshape the future of medicine. And as we're doing that, and an important point for me, I think, is that we're doing all of this work, thinking about equity, thinking about diversity and inclusion, both in terms of access, you know, recognizing there's a digital divide in this country. There are um, remote areas and urban areas that don't have the same kind of bandwidth access, access to, to devices, um, but also sometimes our clinical algorithms might be race-based and, and contribute to some of the inequities and disparities that we see in medicine. So to be very thoughtful about that as we're building those algorithms into these, for example, artificial intelligence programs that we're not building in um, future inequities in medicine, re reinforcing those. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Um... That was really interesting. I want to thank Dr. Quezada and Jose for your insights and, uh, and that engaging discussion. Personally, I'm very much looking forward to um, seeing all these developments in technology that can help our patient community. So in the interest of time, we're going to jump. We've got some hot topics that we need to discuss. So I want to invite everybody back on camera. Let's get all the presenters on. And we encourage everyone listening today to type your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We're going to take as many questions as we can. We understand you may have specific questions about your situation or care. We're gonna answer in a way that may be helpful and applicable to all of our patients. Uh, so if you have more questions about IBD that we can't answer today, please call the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation's IBD Help Center at 888-MY-GUT-PAIN or email info at Crohn'sColitisFoundation.org. Now let's get started. We've got some hot topics. The first one I want to bring up is uh, something that's kind of all over the place everywhere is the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, COVID-19 is still a concern for many patients with IBD. And now that the vaccines have been available for people as young as five years of age, what have we learned about their effectiveness and patient response to the vaccine? And Dr. Dotson, please be sure to add thoughts as it relates to pediatric vaccination. Dr. Quezada, let's start with you. Sure. Well, well, I guess I'll start off just by saying that um, fortunately there were some very uh, forward-thinking folks who, who at the early points of the pandemic started a registry so that we have data that we can look at to learn how effective um, the vaccines have been in preventing um, COVID-19 or at least in sort of mitigating the, the uh, disease uh, in somebody who might act um, who might acquire the infection, but also um, to, to learn about potential side effects uh, and et cetera. So and additionally, there have been some research to looking at uh, the inflammatory response or the immune response is probably a better word I should use here in sort of building immunity in response to vaccination. So just to summarize some findings that have been shown, 
Um, it looks like you know, being on biologic therapy, for example, uh, does not mean that the vaccines aren't going to work for our IBD patients. There have actually been some studies to show um, that you have a comparable response to somebody who's not on biologic. Um, but you know, there also are some showing that it may be a little bit of a, a decreased response, a little bit attenuated. So for that reason, um, some of the recommendations that actually recently come from the CDC uh, at least for adult patients, is if you've had your first two doses, for example, of one of the um, the uh, PCR vaccines, then you actually will um, could count those as your your sort of your first dose, and that a third dose might be your final dose. So uh, the other way you could just look at it is everybody should be getting their booster about six months um, uh, after whenever their that last dose was. So. Um, maybe the most important final point is that the vaccines have been shown to be safe in patients with IBD, that being on immunomodulator or biologic therapy is not a contraindication to getting the vaccine. If anything, it kind of makes it even more important that our patients should be getting that because, you know, we want to give as much support to your immune system as possible to potentially fight a COVID-19 infection. I'll pause there. I know uh, Dr. Dotson probably has some insights on the pediatric patient. Yeah, just a, just a few additional comments. Um, so, so on the pediatric side for the patients that we care for that are over 18, um, you know, we, we follow those same, um, those same recommendations, um, for all of our patients under the age of 18, we also recommend, um, the COVID vaccine right now is only approved down to age five. Um, so we recommend all of our kids age five and up, um, receive the vaccine, uh, the, and, and the an initial, um, vaccination um, series, you know, so for those that are on those immunosuppressant medications that have been um, recommended by, you know, CDC, but also, um, you know, discussed among our expert panels and stuff. There's some additional guidance on the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation website about that as well, um, if you're looking for a resource. Um, the uh, patients that are uh, 12 and over, then we recommend the, the booster, but for that younger age group, the 5 to 11, um, they're, they're not recommending a booster yet for that age group. Um, so it's just the only caveat there. Um, and it's only the the one um, which is Pfizer that is approved down to age five. Thank you, doctors. I appreciate you sharing that information with us. Um, hot topic number two. Now, uh, this one's about family planning and reproduction and IBD. And not many people openly discuss this, but I know many IBD patients think about family planning uh, with IBD. Are there any key takeaways from the Crohn's and Colitis Congress about family planning with IBD? Well, I, I can I can start, and then anyone else is certainly welcome to chime in. I, I think an important takeaway is um, to let your the earlier you can you know communicate to your provider that you're you're you are thinking about this, the better. Um, there are some therapies that you know you may you may not want to be on. Um, mainly methotrexate is one example, but um, for the most part, I think another important point is that it's really, really important to make sure that you are um, experiencing the best disease control at going into uh, the, the family planning process um, so that you reduce your risk of flaring, say, in the middle of a pregnancy or, or, or even in the immediate postpartum phase. So maintaining that close communication and partnership with your provider in, in your treatment plan. Um, and, and importantly that, you know, IBD patients have great outcomes, right? They really have the, the potential for wonderful outcomes. Um, and you can and you should um, have those conversations to make sure you maximize that. Yep. Thanks so much. Oh. Yep. So, so, so just say so similar from our perspective too on the pediatric side. So we have those, you know, discussions, um, particularly more of our, our young females have those conversations, uh, our young, um, uh, the older adolescents, and then the, the, the young adults that we take care of and stuff before college. And usually the discussions more around the, either the, the single use with methotrexate, or if you're using that in combination therapy with a biologic. Um, and then we, we echo the same things to them, you know, as far as, you know, the importance of, you know, family planning. And then if you, you know, know in advance, then we can kind of make some of those arrangements if need if we need to change therapies. But first and foremost, you know, the, most of those medications have been shown to be safe, you know, for a mom and baby. And, and most importantly, it's, you know, mom is, is you know, in, in remission and, and doing well um, in order to have a healthy mom, healthy, healthy baby. So. 
Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Dr. Yen, I understand that you are back with us. Um, any key takeaways from Congress uh, that you had regarding family planning and IBD? Um, no, I, I, I was going to echo what, what Dr. Dotson just said as well, but I, I think just to keep in mind, I think the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation has funded um, research to look at pregnancy and IBD and, and, and medications or something called the piano registry. We're looking at outcomes with um, women who uh, are on medications, especially biologic therapies. And the main message being to stay on your therapies, but certainly talk about your, there's obviously a concern when um, women are either thinking about getting pregnant or getting or, or pregnant um, and they're on some therapy for IBD. But the main point is to, is to just to, is to make sure that you're in disease remission. That is our, that is our main message is to make sure you're doing well from your IBD standpoint. Sure, of course. Thank you. Now, let me ask Jose and Macy, as patients, have you ever had concerns about family planning? Have you addressed those concerns with your um, with your healthcare team? I can I can touch on this. Yeah, as um, a young woman with IBD, um, that's always been a concern of mine. You know, I went through the the most difficult times of my condition when I was a teenager and I was going through puberty. So I had those questions with with my providers, can I have kids? Is that something that is a possibility for me? And that really put my mind at ease because they assured me that, you know, plenty of people with IBD can have kids, should have kids, can be healthy while having kids, things like that. And um, just getting to know so many moms with IBD has helped me as well. You know, it's, it's very doable and um, just talking to your providers helps. Yeah, from a from a male perspective, um, I mean, I was diagnosed when I was 18, having to go through the JPOW surgery laparoscopically, right? That was one of the risks there that the, the doctor shared with me is there is a small risk that this could affect your ability to have children. And I think the main thing is just to have that open communication with your GI in making every decision, because even depending on the types of medications, if you're concerned, just have the conversation. Um, and I think that's just the, the, the key thing there. And just to reiterate what um, Macy and the doctors have shared, there's, I know plenty of IBD um, friends that have had families and, and lived perfectly normal lives, so. Thank you for sharing. And I do know also that AGA also has resources about this topic through their Parenthood Project. So you can visit their website to learn more on that. Um, let's keep going. Uh, as a J pouch patient, one of the concerns that I have, something that I always think about um, and that I've had to manage was pouch failure. Um, there were some discussions at the Crohn's and Colitis Congress about this. Um, can one of the doctors chime in? What does pouch failure mean? Why might it happen and how is it managed? Um, I, can, I can answer that, I guess. I, I, I think... Uh... You know, uh, there rarely there are complications that happen with a pouch. Uh, people can get something called pouchitis. Oftentimes, um, you know, we we generally try to avoid doing pouches in patients with Crohn's disease because they're sometimes associated with, um, you know, worsen outcomes. But I I, I think that um, sometimes we don't know that we don't know a person. Uh, it's sometimes difficult to tell the difference between Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, and so when essentially the pouch doesn't work, it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And um, I think patients start to have more problems with diarrhea or output or um, Crohn's, Crohn's disease complications, et cetera. Um, we, can, we can define that as a pouch complication, not necessarily a pouch failure, but, um, but nowadays we're, we're, treating, we're treating that as well. So I, I think um, sometimes that results in surgery and sometimes it results in medical therapies and it just depends on sort of what the, what the problem is with the pouch. Um, but I, I, I think as, as pouches have become older, you know, in terms of the uh, not, not so new of a technology, I think we as GI doctors have been, we've gotten better at managing those a lot better without saying, you know, oh, this is just a surgery problem. And I think most of the time now that your GI doctor is actually managing the pouch problems, not the surgeon. So I think that's where our field has changed over the years. Great, thanks so much. So as a fellow J poucher, Jose, let me ask you, has has that crossed your mind at all? I know when I went in for surgery, it was like my back was kind of against the wall and I and I kind of had to go through it. Um, how are you? Did you did pouch failure come across your mind as you're, you know, making that decision to have surgery? Yeah. So my J pouch came about from a similar situation. It was it was dire, kind of this is the last option with this flare. 
Um, so it absolutely was a fear, especially early on. Um, Cause as you know, if, if the, back then when we had our shea pouches years ago, if a pouch failure occurred, it would be likely we would have to revert to a permanent ostomy, right? So that was, that was a fear. Um, luckily that, that was not my case. Um, I did have a couple of cases of pouchitis um, shortly after the initial uh, J pouch was created, but that was treated with antibiotics pretty, pretty easily. Um, and yeah, we go through our, our usual annual screening to check up on uh, the pouch and, and do all the biopsies and all of that. So luckily my experience has been extremely positive with the J pouch, but that, that was a fear very early on. Yeah, it's good, good, to, no, good to hear too. I mean, I've had good experiences so far living with a health, healthy J pouch since 2013. So knock on wood, uh, that's, that's good to hear. Um, now, Another hot topic, pediatric IBD transition and accommodations. Let me, let me bring up that many patients with Crohn's or colitis have to advocate their needs in some way during the course of their IBD journey. Um, Donna, as a parent with a child with IBD, how have you had to advocate for accommodations for your son? And how has that experience changed over the years as he's grown from nine now into his teen years? Initially, when he was first diagnosed, I went straight to the school staff to let them know, hey, you know, my son has this condition. These are the things that we need to change. Um, I found out about the 504 plan um, that's available in my state by going to one of the conferences in New Orleans. And that helped us a lot. So now he does have this 504 plan that requires them to make those accommodations for him. So if he needs to go to the restroom, you know, hey, let him go to the restroom. You know, most kids, when they say, hey, I have to go to the bathroom, they're going to play, you know? So I had to stress to his teachers, he's not going to play. He has to go to the bathroom, you know? So that was my biggest concern. And I think having open communication with the teachers and the school staff, it makes a big difference. You know, although I have the 504 plan in place for him, I still like to keep those lines of communication open because he does have this, you know, disease that he's he's going to have to leave out of class sometimes, you know, he's going to need a little bit more time to take his test or, you know, he may have to miss school sometimes because he has to get his infusions, you know, so I make sure that I keep the communication with the teachers, you know, open, and they're very responsive to, to me and, you know, and his concerns. So that, that plays a big part in his education. Great. Thank you so much. And quickly, um, Dr. Dotson, do you see many examples like Donna's story in your practice? Yep, absolutely. So, so we, we have that built into our, our workflows for all of our patients. So at time of diagnosis, we have a, an IBD education um, session with our IBD nurse coordinator and our psychologists, social workers, and dietitians, And we go through um, some of, some of those uh, specific needs. Um, so for mo most of the patients, the 504 plan um, is, is really critical for them with their school. And then depending on the school, um, uh, you know, so having that in place to, um, to allow to have, you know, the specific accommodations for those patients it also starts also playing a true role when it's it's time to take you know your SATs and ACTs and then those college preparatory exams um, and then there's a similar aspect of some things too that we can do to assist with our patients that are going on to college, making sure that they're filing with the disabilities office on campus um, to make sure that they're covered for all of their needs with, you know, assignments and, and coursework, but as well as, you know, financially, or if they would have to take a, a leave of absence for a semester because of complications or flare. Um, so those are all things that we, you know, support them through and, and walk them through. Um, and then from a, a transition skill standpoint, it's, it's important that, you know, we, we work on those independent skills over time. So it's not something you can just, you know, you know, now I'm 18 and I know all this stuff. <laughs> so, um, you know, we, we start working on those skills from around age 12 or so. And so we have a more formalized, uh, you know, curriculum at our institution. And, you know, so we, so we work on, you know, kind of early building skills and then work on that over time. So things like, you know, what, what, what is IBD and where their IBD is and what medications they're on side effects, those types of things. And then kind of um, building on that to where they fill out their, you know, info forms when they come into the office or they're calling to make an appointment or notifying the nurse or sending a, a, a portal message in, in the record 
card, um, carrying their own insurance card, you know, th those types of things. So things to kind of gain that independence and starting to have parts of their visit with us on their own, you know, with, without their parent or guardian present, um, you know, so that way they're gaining those skills over time. So that way they're, they're more comfortable and to be, you know, an advocate and, and knowledgeable of their disease before they move on to the adult world, which is, is typically a different type of uh, practice setting compared to what they might be used to. And then there's also other tools um, that can be helpful in that process. So uh, you know, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation has a lot of transition uh, related information on their website um, that can be really helpful. Um, another free like nonprofit um, uh, access um, for uh, uh, transition things are um, Got Transition. Um, that's the name of the website, just Got Transition. So it has like checklists and things like that. And so um, a lot of our patients use that. Um, and then there's um, also um, an app um, so that we'll recommend for, for some of our patients to find adult providers. Um, so it's doc for me um, um, and they can sign up on the app and then find adult providers that have identified as being um, uh, IBD focused. Um, so that also helps a lot of our, um, you know, young adults trying to find docs, especially in other in other other states or areas that we might not know um, somebody personally to refer them to. So so that's another helpful thing. Um, so if that uh, helps anybody else out that's on the call looking for somebody that might help them too. All right. Thank you so much for sharing. A lot of good resources. A lot of you know opportunities for people to get the care, get access to the care they need. Um, so I just want to thank everybody today. That's all the time that we have questions for today. Um, but before we leave, I just want to take a moment and say thank you to everybody for tuning in. Um, and for all the patients that are tuning in, you know, I was diagnosed in 2010. I had never heard of ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease or IBD. I had a great support system, but I didn't have anyone um, around that knew what I was going through. So I encourage all the patients today not only to learn how to ask the tough questions, because nobody's going to do that for you, um, be your own advocate, and then keep sharing your story. Keep being there for other patients. Keep being um, around. Make yourself available, whether it's through social media, uh, Facebook, Instagram, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. Get involved. Be an advocate, because you will be helping so many other people. It wasn't until I got into, into the IBD community where I really felt like I had found a group of people that knew exactly what I was going through. So um, being a part of this IBD insider, you're already there. You're already taking um, your health into your own hands. Um, that being said, I just want to say a big, big thank you for all the sponsors for today's program one more time. We couldn't do it without you. And with that, I want to say one more time, thank you for joining the IBD Insider Patient Education Program. I hope everybody out there has a great day.